a chance. Have you ever been in a situation in which you really wanted something to work out, but it didn't work out? You felt like if I just had, maybe if I just had another chance, then things might work out. Well, sometimes the second chance is more, is what we just need, but there are other times we need something more than just another chance. We need a change in our lives. Today I'm going to hopefully begin to paint a picture for you using an Old Testament character. And uh, I'd like you to meet the name uh, of a lady by the name of Lisa. She's going to be the lady I'm going to talk about in our gospel story today. I, I don't know her real name because it's never mentioned in the Bible. But she's a Samaritan woman. So we're going to assume her name is Lisa, and we're also going to assume that she's very attractive. It appears that she has everything going her way. What the other ladies wouldn't give to have her beautiful eyes. Gorgeous hair and all the shapes and curves in the right places. What guy wouldn't want to be with Lisa? As soon as she was old enough to get married, the proposals started to come in. First there was Robert. She thought this would be the man of her dreams. So they got married and it was a disaster and then there was a divorce. Lisa's determined not to make the same mistake again, so Jane shows up on the scenes. He promises her the world. She goes for it. Second time she walks down the aisle, it doesn't work out. She finds herself divorced again. Then there was Reggie. Good looking and sweet talking Reggie. Lisa decides to walk the aisle again. I know it's just me. I just turn the lights on and off from up here and I'm just sitting here right one moment and dark the next. I have that way with women, I tell you. I got no words. Thank you. Now I feel like I'm no longer in the dark. Hallelujah. We've got Reggie, the third one. Lisa decides to walk the aisle again. Family members are saying, hey, what, what happened? Is this girl getting married again? Wedding takes place. Something happens during the marriage. And Reggie is history just like all the others. Then John comes to town. He meets Lisa. She's a little worn and battered, but still hoping something good will come to her life. It might happen with a new relationship. They get married and it too doesn't work out. The fourth husband is now long gone. Lisa decides that she could just have one more chance. She could be in a marriage that would last the rest of her life. When David came calling, she took her time with him and all the other women were already talking about her, putting her down and hating on her. She had gone through more husbands than most of them had boyfriends. She agreed to marry David. It started well, but whatever it was that led to the collapse of her earlier marriages led to the downfall of this one. After five husbands, Lisa decides, that's it, I'm not going to get married again. But then Ronald shows up. <laughs> Ronald's not interested in getting married. He does not want to get tied down. He's just looking for someone to live with, so Lisa decides to move in with Ronald. Naturally, all the other women of this little town called Sychar do not want her around with them. They certainly don't want their men around her. So what do you think God thinks about Lisa and her behavior? And that's where we're going to pick up the story this morning in John chapter 4. We find Jesus about to make a journey from the southern part of the country, Judea, to the northern part of the country, Galilee. John 4, 4 says this. Now he had to go through Samaria. The King James Version says he must needs go through Samaria. And before we get to the key players, please allow me to give you some background on Samaria. When Israel was split into nations under King Solomon, you had the nations of Israel to the north and Judah in the south. All the people were still called one nation. And the Jews of Israel in the north were quick to disobey God, and God used the nation of Assyria to defeat them in battle. And the king of Assyria moved most of the people out of the country of Israel and settled them in faraway lands. And then he took the people from faraway lands and he brought them into the country of Israel. 
The ones from faraway lands came to Israel and they brought with them their own gods. But they started to intermarry with some of the Jews who had not been sent away. You see, the Jews were not supposed to intermarry with foreigners, but they did it anyway. The result of these intermarriages eventually became what is called Samaritans, because that part of the country was in Samaria. A hatred and hostility between the Jews and the Samaritan had grown so much because the Jews saw the Samaritans as outside of the promises of God. They were half-breeds. And the Samaritans despised the Jews for always putting them down. This hatred grew so strong that they stopped having anything to do with one another. It was racial prejudice at, it, at its worst. A good Jew would not even travel through Samaria to get home. He would take the longer route of crossing the Jordan River to the east and go through Perea, and then cross the river again back to get to his hometown. Now Jesus is having some huge meetings at this time in his ministry. Large groups of people that were running after John the Baptist are now running after Jesus because he is the miracle worker. But we see that Jesus left the crowd. He left the revivals that he was presenting to the people because the Bible says that he, he had to go through Samaria. Jesus went to a little town called Sychar. There was a piece of land there that was purchased thousands of years earlier. Jacob had given it to his son Joseph. Jacob was the father of 12 children who had become the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph was a guy who almost became the ruler of Egypt. So this piece of land was kind of like a holy site in the middle of the people living in that town called Sychar. And there was a well on the land called Jacob's well. This well was very important to the Samaritans because it was their proof that they could trace their history, their ancestry, back to Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham, who was the father of the Jewish nation. Jesus had now reached this parcel of land with Jacob's well on it. He was tired because he had been traveling for two days. He had sent the disciples ahead into the city to buy some food because they were going to get ready for a party or a picnic when he got back. So this passage shows us that Jesus was human and God at the same time. As a human being, Jesus had grown tired and weary from the long journey. It was noon time, which means it was the hottest time of the day. Jesus was sitting by this well all alone. But there wasn't a bucket nearby, so even though he was near water, he couldn't get a drink. Now you recall one of the main characters of the story, don't you? A lady we call Lisa. Lisa is a Samaritan who lives in the city of Sychar. And remember, things are not going that well between Lisa and Ronald. I can imagine her praying, God, would you please give me another chance to get my life back on track? Since she is on her way to Jacob's well to get water for the day, she is also the source of a lot of town gossip. She tries to go to the well when she knows there wouldn't be very many people hanging around the well. As she approaches this well, she sees their man. And not just any man, but a Jewish man. She figures that she has nothing to lose because no Jewish man would ever talk to a Samaritan woman. So she goes to the well, ignores the man sitting beside it, and drops her bucket into the well. She sees, Jesus sees the Samaritan woman going about her business as if, as if he wasn't there at all. Then Jesus does one of the most radical things in his ministry. He speaks to the woman and says this, Will you give me a drink? Lisa cannot believe this Jewish stranger spoke to her. In shock and disbelief, she responds, You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Please understand. 
Jesus is in the wrong place at the wrong time, talking to the wrong person, and she knows it. Lisa is letting Jesus know that he is out of line on at least three points. First, Jewish males would not travel through Samaria. Second, Jewish males would not speak to a Samaritan, let alone a woman. A rabbi, three, a Jewish male would not drink from a Samaritan's cup. You know what that'd be like? That'd be like sharing a straw with a stranger at Burger King. <laughs> Try it out this afternoon. When you go to a restaurant, walk over to a stranger and say, hey, can I have a sip out of your cup? <laughs> Could I use your straw? <laughs> Not gonna happen! <laughs> Here's the great truth that I don't want you to miss today. Jesus came through Samaria to demonstrate God's love to the unlovely and those who need another chance in life. Lisa, the Samaritan woman, was at a stage in her life when she had voluntarily reduced herself to the status of a prostitute by living with Ronald and being married to five different husbands. And yet, God wanted to give her another chance. It's amazing that out of all the thousands of people Jesus had been ministering to, God said he had to go through Samaria. Through Samaria. The reason Jesus had to go through Samaria was because of one person. A lady by the name of Lisa. A Samaritan woman. He must, needs, go through Samaria. He went to the one that nobody else wanted. Here's another truth that I want you to build your life around. The Lord brings the unloving and the unpopular into our lives so that we might demonstrate what real love looks like. Listen. God didn't save you to turn your nose up at people. He saved you to love them and put up with their smells until they can find their way to the Master and He can take the stench out of their lives. Amen. Never forget what God had to go through to get to you, to give you another chance. As you return to this Gospel narrative, you find Jesus did not try to debate about being a Jew or a Samaritan, that conflict that was going on, Jesus was not about to make a political argument. Instead, he brings to Lisa these points. He begins to educate her on what will ultimately change her life for the better. And he says these words in John 14. If you had knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you the he wanted. The communication here is obvious. When you come to know Christ, the reward that you gain is far greater than any sacrifice you might ever make. Lisa has heard too many lines from too many men to be impressed by what Jesus has to say. She takes one look at him and says this, You don't even have a cup! to get yourself a drink of water. Where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our religious leader, Jacob, who gave us this well to drink from it in the south? I love when a sinner starts to tell God how life works. <laughs> Jesus said, whoever drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I'm going to give him will never thirst again. Indeed, the water that I give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Woo. Yes. Now things are sounding better to the Samaritan woman. To be able to get water without having to come all the way out of town to avoid the gossip of all the other women? 
course, Lisa is still thinking in only human terms. But Jesus was talking about the Spirit of God coming into a person's life. Lisa's mind is still on water. The greater truth is that Jesus is letting us know that whatever we pray for in this life does not bring satisfaction. As human beings, we crave for love and food and sex and security and money and approval. <coughs> Even when we get these things, they do not give us complete satisfaction. We simply thirst again. Do you hard hear me today? Only Jesus, only Jesus can quench the thirst of your soul. Amen. Only Jesus can take the dry areas of your life and bring you to a place of healing and hope. All the water in the world will leave you thirsty for something more. Only Jesus can quench the real thirst of your heart and soul. So Lisa tells Jesus, Sir, give me this water so that I don't have to come here again. If Jesus would just give her what she wanted, she wouldn't care about ever having to see Jesus again. And this begs the question of each of us today. When you ask God for another chance, is your second chance going to lead you to a more faithful walk with God? Or will you just be content with whatever you want from God? Lord, quench my thirst. Give me what I want, but don't ever ask me to change my behavior. Don't ask me to give up my sin. I want you, God. I want another chance. But I also want to keep one foot in the world. Friend, God wants to change your life with living water for an eternity, not just quench your thirst for one day. And the Lord goes about this process by exposing ourselves to ourselves. You say, what? Yes. He exposes ourselves to ourselves. Let me explain. Jesus was about to reveal to Lisa not only that he was a man, but also that he was God. I can see Jesus smiling as he tells Lisa, well, go and call your husband and come back. Uh-oh. Houston, we got a problem. Husband? Did you just say husband? Let me ask, if you were Lisa, how would you respond to this request? I personally think Lisa falls back into her old nature. She's thinking of all this talk from a man was to find out if she was married or not. <laughs> she still has good looks. Her relationship with Ronald, well, it's not so good. She doesn't know who this Jewish guy is. But she kind of likes what he has to offer. He certainly sounds smarter than the other six guys she's with or with. I can imagine Lisa shifting her voice into that seductive tone and her eyes batting as only women can do. <laughs> See, I can't do that. No. It just doesn't, it doesn't convey the same thing. I can hear her saying, I, I have no husband. <laughs> Well, she was right about that point. Her life was a wreck. Any woman who had endured five different husbands would be a wreck too. <laughs> Jesus says, you're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you have had five husbands and the man you're living with right now is not even your husband. What you have said is quite true. Wow, talk about getting real. This woman makes a pass on a Jewish stranger and is exposing all her past failures and sinful activities. Busted! <laughs> she immediately recognizes that Jesus is not like any other man she's ever known before. 
in her embarrassment, she reevaluates her situation and she says, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Now, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but the Jews claim that this place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. She wants to get off the subject of her fornication and adultery as quickly as possible and tries to turn this thing into a religious debate about worship. And I can tell you, friends, whenever you try to lead people to Christ, that's usually the first thing they do as well. Let's just change the subject. Isn't it interesting how Lisa knows about the teachings of God? but does not allow those teachings to affect her life. This woman knew about God and His ways, but was living a life of sin and compromise. Now, I know I'm not preaching to anyone who has a problem like this in the house. Pretending to know God, but not living for God. Having biblical knowledge about God, but living a lifestyle that is contrary to the Word of God. Busted. Then something even more amazing happens. God in His mercy extends grace to her so that she could experience another chance to turn her life around before it's too late. And friends, that's the heart and soul of this story. We serve a God who will give us another chance to make things right. Amen. May we never forget God came to this earth through His Son Jesus to show exceptional love to the prostitutes, to the addicts, to the thieves, and anyone else who needs forgiveness from sin. And yes, even those who are pretending to be religious and godly and living lives that are not worthy of His name. Listen, if God was at work in our lives before we were saved, then how much more does he not want to finish the work that he started? The Bible says, He that began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hear me. God loves you too much to leave you the way you are. He wants to change you, transform you. Because true love contends for the best in each of us. Then Jesus ends his conversation by declaring, Believe me, woman. <laughs> I just love that. Believe me, woman. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> a time has come when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvations of the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true True worshipers who worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And those are the kind of worshipers that God is seeking. God is spirit and the worshipers must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Jesus brings this encounter to the head by pointing out that both the Jews and the Samaritans have missed God on this point. They were missing the true meaning of worship. And oh, how often we do the same thing. We think worship is a building or a style or a song. Worship is none of those things. Worship is all about a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Woo. Anytime worship is about something else other than Jesus and lifting Him up, you miss the heart of worship. Yes. Now let me give you a couple truths about what worship is. True worship is not a place. It's not a place. You don't have to go to a special mountain to experience God. Oh, if I could just get to that mountain, that revival, that place that I could really worship God. It's not about a place. You worship in your car, in your home, in your shower. Jesus rent the veil to give us access to the Father so that we can come boldly into the throne of grace and receive mercy and love in a time of need. That's true worship. Worship's not a place. True worship is a person. In other words, you have to know the person you're worshiping. You don't worship a star, an object. Worship a person. 
We don't worship in ignorance or despair. We worship joyfully the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when heaven and earth pass away, we'll be gathering around the throne of God, worshiping and crying out, Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb of God. Three, salvation comes only from worshiping the right person. You know, we're living in scary days and perilous times. The spirit of the world is saying there are many ways to reach God and be saved. But Jesus said there's only one way. Amen. Jesus is the way. Amen. You cannot come to God except through Jesus. It's not Joseph Smith. It's not Muhammad. It's not Allah. Friends, it's Jesus and Jesus only. He's the only way. Forward the hour for true worship is now. It's now. Some people think true worship will only happen when we get to heaven. Yes, we'll have true worship in heaven and spirit directed worship in heaven. But true worship can take place anytime and anywhere. That's what I love most about worship. I can be on a mountain or by a lake. I can be in a church or out in the country. I can do it in the morning or in the afternoon. David said seven times a day, I'm going to praise you. Amen. Worshiping God should be a part of our everyday lives and not just something we do on Sunday. Amen. If you only worship God on Sunday, mm, that's interesting. Number five. All who worship in spirit and truth will find God. Amen. God is looking. He's hunting. His eyes are going back and forth across the earth. He's looking for true worshipers, not phony worshipers. He desires and seeks out all those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth, not in false pretense or religiosity. I believe all worship begins with a prayer, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me, God, into the way of everlasting. As long as we allow unconfessed sin to dwell in us, worship cannot take place in our lives. Oh, you can sing the songs, go through the motion, but there's no true worship in your heart. There's no truth in your inward being. In worship, we need to constantly be saying, Lord, forgive me how I treat others. Lord, forgive me how I treat my kids, my parents, my spouse. Lord, forgive me for not doing, saying, acting, or thinking in a way that's pleasing to you. This is where the second chance comes in. Lord, give me another chance to get things right. I want to be in a relationship with you. One that produces truth, not falsehood. There's no worship apart from truth. Our worship must be genuine in the way God has called us to worship. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. When Jesus spoke of a day coming, the Samaritan woman responded by saying this, I know, I know that when Christ, the Messiah, comes, He will explain everything to us. She has
in other places in the Bible, the Lord doesn't want to know. He doesn't even want people to know who He is. He speaks in parables, which are hidden truths, mysteries. Jesus often is telling people not to reveal His identity, but not in this case. Makes you wonder why all the people that Jesus encountered, He chose to reveal His true identity to a woman, a prostitute, that He was the Christ. Messiah. I believe it's because he wants us to know that none of us are beneath his love and care and wanting to give us another chance. The world looked and they saw a prostitute. God looked and he saw a future evangelist. Hallelujah. Oh, your family might think of you as nothing. Your classmates might not have voted you as the one who will succeed. But not Jesus. He always picks you to be on his team. You're his first choice. And you say, preacher, how do you know that? Because he picks somebody that nobody else would ever pick. Amen. <laughs> she was a Samaritan, a half-breed. She was married five times. Talk about a terrible label to live down. She was a prostitute. They were stone prostitutes in that day. She was a woman. Women were regarded as property, not as rightful heirs. And yet, here comes Jesus down the dusty road of Samaria because he must needs go through Samaria. He had to go. God compelled him to go. Why? Because the lowest of the low needed another chance. Amen. He needed another chance. What a miracle. <laughs> and Jesus offering this grace and mercy toward this woman, it shocked. It shocked the disciples. It just blew them away. It bucked their religiosity. Because the Bible says the disciples marveled. They marveled. They were amazed that he was speaking with a woman. I don't know what he's doing. It's a woman. Or it's a man. She's a prostitute. I don't know, James. Doesn't make sense. We shouldn't be here. Oh, friends, that's the gospel of God. Going where we should be. I say, yes, we should be there. Yes, we should be on the streets. Yes, we should be in the world sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Blew them away. So God gave this woman another chance and it changed her life from being an outcast to being one of the greatest evangelists who ever were called by God. This woman went and turned her city upside down for Jesus. Because the Bible tells us in John 4, the woman left her water jar. Oh, hallelujah. When God got a hold of her, she didn't need anymore a natural water. She had Jesus. She came thirsty. She left filled. So you need to leave your water jar behind. Just leave it behind. She went to the town. She began to tell people, come see the man who has told me everything that I ever did. Friend, God knows everything you ever did. He knows where you were last night. She says, can this be? Is this not the Christ? So people left the town and set out to go find him, to see him. Hallelujah. <laughs> the outcast, the prostitute, the woman of town is now telling people about Jesus. You talk about a radical change of God in her life. Glory. Many people believe Jesus because of her testimony. She knew 
what it was to begin to worship God in spirit and in truth. So let me conclude with this question. What would happen in our lives if we discovered who Jesus truly is and we began to worship Him in spirit and in truth? Well, I think the same thing would happen as it did this world. We would be changed and we would begin to change the world around us. Sometimes all we need is another chance. Do you bow your head with me? Well, Father, thank you for your love. Thank you, God, that you went to Samaria. So Mary is every person sitting in this room. Oh, Jesus. Thank you that you demonstrated love. Not only to the Jew, but the Samaritan and the Gentile. Thank you, God. Lord, seal up these truths in our hearts. If your heads are bowed, friend, let me ask how many would say to the Lord today, I need another chance. I need another chance in my relationship with God. Oh. Now I've been living for Him. You've been living for yourself. If you need another chance, God's here to give you another chance. If you let Him, He can take that thing out of your life. He can set you free. But you've got to give Him a chance. You'd say, Pastor, that's me. I'd like you to lift your hand right now. You say, I need to give God another chance. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, friend. Thank you. Thank you. You won't be disappointed. Give God another chance. I'm going to say, Pastor, I need another chance in my marriage. We need a miracle. Things are not right. You just look up at me and say, We need a miracle in my relationship with my wife, my husband. Yes, friend, God knows. You say, Pastor, I need another chance in my finances. Just lift your hand and say, Man, I know. I need another chance here. How about in your relationship with others? It's a pastor, things are just not right in my relationship with others. I need another chance. Hallelujah. The Lord sees you. He knows you. He sees your heart. Let's all stand together. Hallelujah. I'm just going to open the altars. I know some will slip out into their classrooms, and I encourage you to do so. But I want to open these altars for those today that need another chance. I want to pray with those. I might not have listed what it is you need another chance in, but I know that God has spoken to your heart today. Father, go with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Keep this sanctuary, Lord, a place of holiness in our lives. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. I know some